the reason why I'm saying that is because I don't know if you tried or or attempted to make the connection between a lot of your work and what some of the uh, let's say leading edge cog sci stuff that is coming out. I've been had a lot of conversation with John Ravaki, and obviously Jordan Peterson talks about this uh, a lot, which is that the, even our categoric our category structure, right? Even the way in which we recognize beings in the world is related to constrained purpose, right? So why we even identify beings is related at the first level to the reason why we are identifying it, right? So I don't see a cup. I see something to drink from, right? And so I don't see a chair, I see something to sit on. And that all identities are actually constrained by purpose because the border between identities is not is not that obvious, right? Without intelligence, even the actual identities themselves. And and our our argument is that is that entities that manifest uh purposive function or behavior are invariably the the product of mind mm, in our yeah. experience. And that's especially true when we're talking about information. The argument I make in a book called Signature in the Cell is that whenever we see information in a digital or alphabetic form, as we do at the foundation of life, uh, and we trace that information back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And then I ask people to think, well, what are some examples? Well, a hieroglyphic inscription. You see that on the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum, you're not going to infer wind and erosion. You're going to realize there was a scribe there. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a computer program comes from a programmer. Uh, a paragraph in a book comes from a writer. Information embedded in a radio signal or a, being transmitted across the internet ultimately goes back to a speaker, a broadcaster. Informa if we trace information back to its source, the one thing we know very, very confidently is that information always arises from a mind or an intelligence. And that relates to some of the things we were talking about at the beginning of the interview, that if information is related to e electing some options and eliminating others, in other words, constraining possibilities, that information is imparted as possibilities are constrained. And, and, and so a constraint represents a choice, a, a choosing between an interlego. Um, well, then... Interlego is actually what we mean by intelligence, that intelligence is choosing between the options. Yeah. Um, there are things that do happen randomly, but the uh, there are limits to what are called the probabilistic resources of the universe. And the amount of information in the, uh, the linguistic transmission that we're participating in right now, and the amount of information in a computer program, and the amount of information in a DNA molecule all exceed what you can reasonably expect to occur by random random processes or stochastic processes, even if you take into account the entire history of the universe. So we're with, with DNA, we're well beyond that probabilistic threshold into a, a, a both an amount of information and a kind of information, which is indicative of intelligence. Yeah. And it, I mean, it seems to me too, that, you know, even taking, you know, the, the idea of, of random mutation and the notion of constraint, right? So you can, you can use the word patterning, right? To talk about constraint. It's like, basically you have a bunch of stuff and then that stuff is actually ordered in a manner that makes it into some, turns it into something else, right? So you have bunch of stuff, you order it together. And now it's not just a bunch of stuff. It's an actual animal or it's a chair or it's, you know, whatever it is that I can identify as being, because it's made of stuff, right? It's made of all these different levels of things, but that, that patterning itself, it seems like it has to, it, it just has to, has to pre-exist to some extent for the, for the patterns to be like to come into to the pattern, right? So it's like, even if you have a bunch of stuff and it comes into a pattern, that pattern makes sense. And it makes sense to form a new being that is a higher level of being, you could say a, a more complex level of being. It's like, what is calling that into being? Like what is, what is the pattern has to at least well, in some just, manner pre-exist. Yeah, this is something, uh, uh, a connection I explore in some of my work, the connection between form yeah. and information. And uh, the the you know medieval philosophers like uh, Thomas Aquinas talked a lot about formal causes, uh, and they were drawing on an Aristotelian background. And Thomas himself had a notion called exemplar causation, which was the idea that there's form in matter that results first in an idea, an exemplar in the mind of a creator. So if we have a we have a chair that we're sitting on. There's a we can we can describe that as a form 
a structure, uh, but we know that that came from a, an idea in the mind of a carpenter. So that the, the the form we see in matter issues from a a, a, a different kind of form, an idea or pattern in, in the mind of, of of a creator. And so there, there's a connection between form and in if you can think of an idea as informing inf information. And I think in modern in uh, modern engineering, uh, with the idea of information theory and with in other informational concepts, um, we we see there's a, a, a similar connection in biology between form and information. That the three dimensional structure of an organism depends upon information that's encoded in DNA, but also information that's encoded three dimensionally in other parts of the organism. Mm -hmm. That's why we get back to that idea of a hierarchical organization of 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 information generating biological form. But even in the recognition of the being, so right, so you have apples. So say you have a bunch of apples. Like every single one of those apples is different. None of those apples are exactly the same. So how do I recognize identity across variation? Because they're all different. And so there, there, there has to be a pattern that links them together that makes it possible for me to recognize the 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 fact that they all participated in a singular identity. Yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. And, yeah. and the, so that's a very mysterious in thing. Epistemology as well. How do we recognize universals among all the different particular manifestations of those universals? But and that seems to be something we seem to be able to do it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, humans seem to be particularly good at that, and uh, you know, and that seems to place them in a particular position. Uh, you know, and sometimes I'll hear it's interesting because sometimes I'll hear something people say something like atheists will say, "Well, humans are the universe knowing itself," right? And it's like, yeah, universe. <laughs> humans are the universe knowing itself. It means that the universe is intelligent because we're intelligent. I don't know what to say. It's like we are part of the universe and we're the place where intelligence, you know, let's say uh, intelligence finds its highest form that we know of, that we know of in the created world. And therefore the universe is intelligent because it's like, it's like if I take your body and I say, well, you're not intelligent because your fingernail is not intelligent and your thumb's not intelligent and your, you know, your, your ear is not intelligent, but Stephen Meyer is intelligent. And so, that's the same with the universe, right? It's like the universe is intelligent because we're intelligent. I know that that might I know that that might not convince a bunch of atheists, but yeah, it just seems like there's a way in which often I've noticed that atheists tend to abstract themselves from the from the reality and not consider the place of man in the cosmos. Whereas, like in in the biblical cosmology, you know, the human is placed in a very particular place in the middle of the whole system. And is given to name the animals, like is given to continue that process of information that happens in creation, um, and therefore it is in some ways the place of knowledge in the world is is the human person. Um, anyways, that's a bit taking you off well, track I, there. I, it 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 reminds me of the book that was published a few years ago by Thomas Nagel, a very famous atheist philosopher of science, who had come to be very skeptical of Darwinian evolution and also origin of life research, uh, origin of life, I mean, the chemical evolutionary theory of the origin of the first life. And he wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, mm. subtitle, <clears throat> how the neo-Darwinian materialist view of reality is almost certainly false. And so he was, uh, and, and a, a big part of his argument was that any, any theory of origins that can't account for mind yeah. is missing something really big. And the neo-Darwinian theory of biological origins cannot account for mind, and therefore it's missing something really big.